start the recording and we're recording for anybody that's not able to join us tonight this is uh, going to be the first week of our p1 private pilot ground school we'll be starting in about three minutes Pressure. Oh, great. Now the two pressure uh, inducers are here. <laughs> uh, and Brian's going to be writing down all the things he thinks I messed up on. Hey, James. Oh, what's up, Mattel? You stick a piece from Alejandro's books. I basically have music playing in the background while he waits to start his presentation. Oh. I <laughs> if I, if I, I do have music available, I just don't know how to get it into my microphone. Come on, play the piano for all of us. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a more intimate process, Brian. <laughs> And I've even done inspirational videos and everything. Mm -hmm. You could learn something from Alejandro's videos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it looks like we got about five seconds until we start here. All right. <clears throat> we'll start two seconds early, and there we go, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern on the dot. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right. All right. So uh, just a, a little kind of disclaimer here at the beginning. Uh, I'd like it if everybody, unless you have a question that's kind of urgent, if we everyone can keep their mics muted throughout the uh, school tonight. If you do have a question, I'm going to be keeping my eye on the group flights channel. Uh, and we'll try to answer it right after we're done with each slide. Um, but I really plead with you, if you could just hold your questions to the end, we're going to have kind of like a Q&A at the end if we have some extra time. And, uh, and we'll go over something. So if you, if you feel like you're confused about something, write a little note and we'll come back to it later on. All right, well, let's kick, the, uh, let's kick into motion here and get into first gear. So let's talk about the course goals a little bit that we want to establish here uh, with this ground school. So the main goal of the ground school is we want to establish uh, a basic or intermediate understanding of the knowledge you're going to need to know for the P1 rating as well as private pilot ground. Um, we also want to establish qualities that will successfully prepare you to begin the P2 rating, which is our instrument rating. And we also want you to become familiar and comfortable with concepts that are required to conduct a flight on VATSIM. So let's talk just a little bit about me, introduce you guys to myself. I'm an FAA commercial pilot. I have my single engine land rating. I'm also an FAA advanced ground instructor. I got my private pilot license when I was 17 years old. I'm currently working on my certified flight instructor uh, license, and I'm currently in college for a Bachelor of Science in Aviation Administration. So the first lesson, uh, and probably one of the most important ones of uh, the private pilot rating, is aerodynamics. And we're going to talk a lot about aerodynamics today. So we're going to go over the basics of aerodynamics, how wings work, how air pressure is related into it, and a lot more. 
And all of this knowledge, along with everything else we're going to learn throughout the next 11 weeks, contributes to being a safe and knowledgeable pilot. So we're going to get right into the uh, moving train here. So let's talk about some <clears throat> aerodynamic terms. So essentially, every airplane has what's known as an airfoil, which is essentially what the aerodynamic surfaces are. A wing is an example of an airfoil. A, a horizontal stabilizer is a type of airfoil. A vertical stabilizer, which is uh, basically what the rudder is connected to, is a form of an airfoil. And the exact definition is a structure or body which produces a useful reaction to air movement. And I give a couple examples here. We got wings, rotor blades, and propellers. Now something important with an airfoil is what's known as the cord line. And that's here, right with this right diagram over here. And that's the line which connects the leading edge of an airfoil to the trailing edge. So basically the front to the back, right down the middle of the airfoil, there's this imaginary line, and that's called the cord line. And that's going to play a little bit when we talk about angles in a little bit. Uh, and thirdly, the relative wind is essentially just the wind that's felt by an airfoil. So if we look at the bottom diagram here, this shows the flight path of the, yellow, of the uh, airfoil and the relative wind. And the relative wind is always just the air moving over the airfoil. So now we're going to talk about something which is called angle of attack. Uh, and imagine you have an airfoil. And we were talking about that cord line before, which is that line that goes from the front to the tail edge. And the angle between the relative wind and that cord line is called the angle of attack. And we're going to talk about why that's important in a little bit. But just remember that that angle between the cord line of the wing and the relative wing is called the angle of attack. Another thing which is critical for the way planes fly is the angle of incidence. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, you can't control this. This is set by the manufacturer when they put the wing on the airplane. And essentially, this is the angle between the uh, airplane and the wing. So this is not controllable by you. There's no way you could control this. It's basically the way that the wing is bolted onto the airplane. So we're, we're moving along pretty fast here. We're already in section two. Uh, and we're going to talk about the axes which airplanes roll around. Now, there's three main axes, um, and there's three main movements associated with those axes, which are pitch, yaw, and roll. So pitching is around the lateral axis, if we look at the diagram here. The lateral axis runs from wingtip to wingtip, and that is the pitch motion that an airplane will perform. Yawing is around the vertical axis. That can You can imagine that goes directly from top to bottom through the plane, and an airplane will rotate around that axis to yaw. And the third and final uh, movement we have is roll. And that roll is around the longitudinal axis. And the longitudinal axis runs from, you could say, the tip of the propeller or the nose of the airplane all the way to the tail of the plane. And the airplane moves around that axis, this imaginary line, to roll. So we'll get a little bit more into detail about pitch here. We're going to talk a little bit about those three motions. So pitch is basically the rotation up or down of an airplane and you can change this by using the elevators on an airplane so if we talk about an aircraft like the Cessna 172 you have the tail of the airplane and connected to the rear you have a fixed surface which is the horizontal stabilizer and attached to the back of that you have the elevators so those elevators change their angle to deflect air upwards or downwards and will create a pitching motion so when you raise the elevator on an airplane, you're forcing the tail down and the nose of the airplane up. So I'll try to draw this a little bit. So here we have a pointer. We're pushing the tail down and the nose comes up. And the opposite applies. So when you push the elevator down, the force is tailed up and the nose is forced down. And Matteo wanted me to cover a little bit how different aircraft have different types of elevators or different types of pitch control surfaces. So most air aircraft, like the 172, have that horizontal stabilizer, which is fixed, and movable elevators on the rear. But I don't know how many of you are familiar with Piper aircraft. Those have a completely variable pitch horizontal stabilizer on the rear. It's called a stabilator. And essentially, there's no fixation to the horizontal stabilizer. The entire assembly moves as one. So if we look here at this little horizontal stabilizer, on a Piper product, this entire piece would move and basically 
change the way it's cutting through the air to either force the tail up or force the tail down. So we'll talk about roll now. And roll again is that rotation along the longitudinal axis. So same thing as the elevator. It's forcing uh, an aerodynamic surface up or down. But we have two wings. So one is going up and one is going down. So lowering an aileron on one of the wings will raise that wing. So let's say we're making a, uh, a right turn. So the plane's facing us. So the plane's going to be making a right turn. So this wing here on our left is the right wing. That's going to be banking down. And the left wing, which is on our right, is going to be banking, uh, is going to be pitching up. So what happens is the aileron on the right wing deflects upwards. The aileron on the left wing deflects downwards, which causes this wing to go up, this wing to go down. And when you do the uh, a turn in the direction the other way, it's vice versa. So the opposite happens. This one goes uh, down, this one goes up. Now, if we talk about that in a little more detail, there are some problems with that. When, when the wing that has the lowered aileron goes down, it creates a lot of drag, and it also creates a lot of extra lift. So what happens with that is we get this effect called adverse yaw. And what adverse yaw is, we'll talk about it, I believe, in the next slide, is a yawing motion in the opposite direction of roll. And that happens because when you get all that extra uh, lift on one wing, you also get this thing called induced drag, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. It's essentially drag caused by lift. And we also have um, less induced drag on the wing that's uh, the opposite wing. So if we're making a right turn, this wing's going up. So this wing's developing less lift, which is reducing the amount of drag. This one's increasing the amount of drag. So I'll, I'll show you in the next slide when we get to yaw how, how that ex exactly happens. So we'll keep talking about that. Let's say this aileron here on the right wing goes up, this one goes down. So we're making a right turn, but this aileron is now beneath the wing in a sense, and the airflow that comes this way yaws the plane to the left because you have all this extra drag from this wing creating lift. I, now this is a little confusing for some people, so if you have any questions, please ask now about this because um, I'd rather cover it, and I'm sure a lot of you are confused by my sort of explanation about it. But if anybody has a question about this, uh, you can go ahead and ask. Otherwise, I'll move on if nobody has a question. Okay. So moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about center of gravity. Now, every aircraft has a center of gravity. Actually, Ivan's typing, so I'll see what he has to say. Uh, what exactly are differential ailerons? Oh, yeah, my bad. I should probably mention that. So... Differential ailerons are essentially ailerons that one will pitch up less than the, they're not directly linked. So, you know, if one goes up 45 degrees, the other one's not going to go down 45 degrees. Um, I don't know if I can draw with this. I'll try to draw it. Um, let's say this aileron uh, goes down or, or goes up. This one won't go down as much to uh, prevent that excess drag on that one wing. So it basically causes one aileron to go further than the one that's causing drag. Uh, if I can draw, which maybe I will at the end, uh, it'll prevent you from yawing by basically counteracting the effects of, of the drag that's created. Um, that's the best way I can explain it. Uh, but we can go more into that in we can go more into detail with that at the end. Uh, I can draw some stuff and, and show you some more diagrams. Uh, but back to center of gravity, every aircraft has a center of gravity. It doesn't matter if it's a 172, a 747, a Piper Cub, every single one has a center of gravity. And the center of gravity is essentially the point at which all the weight is concentrated. And basically, if you were to hold an airplane from that point, I know you probably can't, it would balance itself out. It would be completely level and balanced. And CG is represented by this kind of like a nuclear symbol, I guess you could call it. If you could see that there. So, first things first, uh, every airplane has four forces. <clears throat> and those four forces are lift, weight, thrust, and drag. Now, this is what the textbook says here. Uh, but this is the reality here. 
So the reality is uh, dreams take you to the sky, reality brings you down, money pushes you forward, and the FAA is pulling you back. I will point out, since I'm not hearing any laughs, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a joke. Uh, this is reality. So thrust is essentially the forward pulling or pushing force, because some airplanes have a propeller that pushes you, that propels an aircraft forward. Drag is the force which acts against thrust and pulls an aircraft back, which is demonstrated by this arrow here. Weight is the force of gravity which pulls an aircraft to the ground. And lift is the force generated by pressure, or which is, again, generated by the wings or the airfoil, which counteracts gravity. So that's essentially the upward lifting force. And now we're going to explain what lift is in what I think is the, one of the simplest explanations. Uh, lift is an upward force generated by differences in air pressure. And we're, if you're confused by that, we're going to talk about it. I have a diagram on the next page. Uh, but what you have to remember is, is this other principle that we're going to talk about now called Bernoulli's principle. And this is one of the things that makes lift possible. And Bernoulli's principle says, now, this, now it says a fluid. It says as a speed of a fluid changes... And a fluid means anything. It can mean air or water, which are the two types of fluids. You can't really have uh, fluid solids. That's not a thing. But a fluid, air or water, or, or any kind of liquid or gas, uh, as the speed of a fluid increases, pressure and temperature of that fluid decrease. And the vice versa also applies. As the speed decreases of a fluid, pressure and temperature increase. And... This is what we call a Venturi, and a Venturi is basically used to demonstrate Bernoulli's principle. So if you have air moving in here and the volume is decreased, the air has to speed up. And as a result of that, the pressure here decreases. And that, that's essentially Bernoulli's principle. It applies everywhere in aerodynamics. You're going to hear it. You know, if you're a science major, you're going to talk about Bernoulli's principle or earth science or anything like that. Everything regarding lift is because of Bernoulli's principle, but also because of Newton's third law, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so here's another explanation about lift. Lift is generated when the high pressure area on the bottom of wing tries to cancel out the low pressure area on the top of the wing. And because of Newton's third law, with, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law. An upward motion is created. So, essentially, positive pressure does not like low pressure, and they try to cancel each other out. So, because of that, you get, um, you get a upward motion, which is lift. And we'll talk about this a little bit. So, how are these areas generated? Well, essentially, Bernoulli's principle says, as the uh, speed of the fluid increases, this pressure area decreases. So, as the air hits the airfoil... The top part has to increase its speed to basically meet the air at the bottom. And the high pressure area, which is basically getting impacted with air because the angle of attack here is great enough to generate lift. You get this big positive pressure area on the bottom, which is different from that low pressure area on the top. So the speed, the air here is decreasing its speed, which is causing the pressure to increase. The air here is increasing its speed, which is causing the pressure to decrease, and they cancel each other out. Does anybody have any questions about that? I know it's a little confusing. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just had a quick question. Sure. Uh, will, the, will the positive pressure, will that always be on the bottom of the air, what, air aileron or whatever? Sure, so you can think of it now, this is where it gets a little tricky, right? So you, it's always going to be on the bottom in relation to where gravity is, right? So if an airplane's inverted, right, the positive pressure is not on the top of the wing anymore. It's now on the uh, bottom of the wing, right, or the, or the part closest to the surface of the Earth. So it basically gets flipped upside down in inverted flight. But it's always going to be on the lower part of the aileron that's closer to the surface or, or to where the gravity is pulling you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So now we're going to talk about uh, drag. So drag is the rearward acting force on an airplane. Um, yes, Steve. Okay, yeah. So we'll go back to what Steve's acting. So Bernoulli's principle 
is true, but what you're referring to is commonly known as that equal uh, distance method where an airfoil has to be shaped a certain way. The truth is any object will develop lift. You can have a flat sheet of metal that will develop lift. Bernoulli's principle simply says that as a fluid speed increases, it decreases in pressure. So let's say this were a flat object and it were deflecting air downwards. That air here on the bottom is being basically crushed and that's creating a high pressure area. And compared to the air on the top, it's much higher pressure. So because of Newton's third law, it's being pushed upwards. So that's why when you flip an airplane upside down, you're now the top of, or what was the top of the wing is now the bottom of the wing. And that's, again, you got that positive pressure on the bottom and that lower pressure on the top, which causes lift. So it doesn't really matter about the shape of the aileron. It has more to do with the way air is deflected. Does that make sense, Steve? Okay, cool. So let's get back to drag. And drag is a rearward acting force which resists the forward movement of an airplane through the air. Um, sorry, somebody DM'd me. I got off track there. So there's two main types of drag. There's also others, but we'll talk about these main two. Parasite drag, which is the resistance of air due to parts of an airplane which don't produce lift. So let's think about all the parts of an airplane that don't reduce, produce lift, right? The landing gear, right? A 172, they're big, you know, struts with wheels and, and they aren't really contributing to the flying characteristics of an airplane. Um, radio antennas, they don't contribute any lift. So we can say that those are examples of um, parasite drag. Um, now induced drag, we talked about this before is a byproduct of lift. Um, so in other words, we'll go off exactly what I wrote here. Drag is created as a wing develops lift. And this drag is caused by a vortex known as wake. And we'll talk about wake turbulence when we get towards the end, but all you have to know now is this drag is caused by um, a vortex. Another thing you remember, aircraft developed most of these wing vortexes when they're slow. They're generating the most amount of lift when they're slow, hence you're going to get a greater vortex. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Here uh, we're showing <clears throat> the effects of drag as you increase airspeed. So this graph says as you increase speed, parasite drag, which is the effect, uh, the drag from like radios and landing gear, increases as you increase speed. But it also says, as you increase speed, that the induced drag is reduced, which is that byproduct of lift. So as airplanes get faster, they're actually developing less and less lift because they require less of an angle of attack. We talked about that before. The angle of attack is the angle between the airfoil and the relative wind. So as you go faster, you don't need to cut through the air as much or deflect the air as much because you're going a lot faster. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about uh, the next thing. So aircraft stability, uh, every aircraft we can say is stable, right? At least for the most part. Most of the trainers that you're going to fly, 172s, Piper Warriors, Piper Archers, they're all inherently stable. And what that means is stability is the ability of an airplane to return or not return to its original flight condition after being disturbed by an outside force. Now, we can talk about what an outside force is. An outside force, a good example, turbulence. Another outside force is also you deflecting the controls, you turning the ailerons, you pulling the elevators. That is an outside force. Um, and aircrafts have, aircraft have two types of stability. You have static stability and dynamic stability. Static stability is basically the tendency for an aircraft to return or not to return to its initial position. And that's basically exactly what I said with stability. Where it gets more confusing is when you get into dynamic stability. And dynamic stability is the stability of an airplane measured over a period of time. Now, if you're confused by this, I have a diagram. Don't worry, it's going to make it a lot more um, less complicated. So this is this diagram here is static stability. Um, we're going to talk about dynamic stability on the next slide. But positive stability is a tendency for an aircraft to move toward its original position after a disturbance. So let's say uh, turbulence knocks your airplane down, right? And the airplane's pointing down. If an aircraft is positively stable, it'll 
just basically return to where it was in level flight. And that you can say is a positive, positively static airplane. Uh, if it's neutral in its stability, let's say that turbulence knocks your nose down, that airplane is going to stay down. It's just going to stay exactly where the turbulence left it, and that is neutral stability. Now, this is the dangerous one. Let's say an aircraft is negatively stable. If that turbulence knocks your nose down, well, your airplane is going to respond negatively, and it's just going to keep pitching down and keep pitching down until you correct for it. Uh, and so that can pose a problem. <clears throat> really, what you want to find is either positive stability or neutral stability. You don't really want an aircraft that's negatively stable. So now we're going to talk about uh, dynamic stability. So dynamic stability is essentially um, the stability or static stability over time, right? So an aircraft, one thing to remember is an aircraft which is statically unstable cannot be dynamically stable in any form. I'm sorry, did you have a question? I guess not. Okay. Uh, yeah, so an aircraft that is statically uh, unstable, so let's say it's negatively stable, or just not stable in any form, cannot be dynamically stable because you got to remember dynamic stability is stability over time. So if it's not stable, well, it's not going to be stable over time. Simple as that. Uh, so if you have positive dynamic stability, you can say this, that the aircraft oscillations dample, dampen out over time. And if you look at diagram A here, this is positive dynamic stability. So let's say that turbulence knocks you down. Well, the airplane's going to counteract that and go up. And then it's going to realize it's too far up and it's going to go down. And eventually you're going to get back to level flight. If it's neutrally dynamic, over time, the oscillations don't get better and they don't get worse. So if you get knocked down by that turbulence, it's just going to keep going up and down and up and down and never dampen out. Now, the dangerous one, again, is that negative dynamic stability. And the aircraft oscillations will get worse over time. So let's say you're here and turbulence knocks you down. Well, over time, those oscillations are just going to keep getting worse and worse. And that is the simplest explanation I can give you of dynamic stability. You have the three types, positive, neutral, negative. They all cause a different effect on the aircraft. Does everybody get that? Good. All right, cool. So now we're going to talk about center of gravity again. We talked about it before, how every aircraft has one, 737, 172. doesn't really matter. They all have them. Um, so the center of gravity is where all the weight of an airplane is concentrated, and it's very important for balancing an aircraft in flight. Um, aircraft can be adversely affected by their CG position. Uh, if the center of gravity is outside of a standardized uh, position or, or a, an envelope, as they call it, you might have heard that before, you know, if you've watched Top Gun, you know, they say, oh, we're going to teach you to push the F-14 to the edge of the envelope, right? They're referring, you know, to center of gravity in a sense. Um, it's involved with that. They're more talking about flight performance, but there's a center of gravity envelope. There's a two limits to center of gravity. You ha every aircraft has a forward limit and an aft limit. Um, so if you have your center of gravity too far forward or too far backwards, it's going to affect the way an aircraft flies. So here you can see, if you look at the diagram, the center of gravity is within the forward limit and it's within the rear limit, which means that the aircraft is going to fly guaranteed the way the manufacturer says. Now let's say you take this center of gravity and put it in front of this. Well, that's, that's no good. That means you're going to have some forward center of gravity effects. So what this means is you're going to have increased stability along your, your pitch axis, right? So along your uh, lateral axis, you're going to have increased stability. You're going to have a lower cruise speed because the tail has to push further down on the plane, and you're going to have a higher angle of attack. And you're also going to have a higher stall speed because of the higher angle of attack, and you're closer to the point at which a wing will stall. Now, if your center of gravity is too far aft, it's behind this uh, red line here, it's too far aft, you're going to have decreased pitch stability, along, uh, basically pitches around the lateral axis, if we remember. That's going to be all over the place. It's going to be very hard to control your pitch, uh, and it's not going to want to you know, respond nice and smoothly. Now, you're also going to have a higher cruise speed because you have that lower angle of attack. And because of that, you also have a lower stall speed 
But the problem with that is if you get put into a stall or a spin, even worse, you're going to have very poor recovery characteristics because the airplane can't lower its nose to recover out of a spin or a stall. So what we can say all of this because of all this is that keeping an aircraft within its center of gravity limits is critical to the safe operation of an airplane. Cool. I'm just going to take a sip of water here and we'll move on. Um, so can I ask a quick question about that? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so we saw the we could uh, we saw it could go forwards and backwards. Couldn't it also go up and down? If you see what I mean, it it can. Uh, but that's not as important as um, it's not as important for flight, uh, the up and down CG because it it all has to do, um, it all really has to do with forward or back because the elevator and the wing don't care how high up you are. Um, okay. It's basically a balance game. So you know, if you're higher up, it's not going to change the way the plane's balanced in relation to gravity. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot. No problem. Uh, Thorsten, yes. It does exist left and right um, on larger aircraft like airliners. Um, but for P1, that's not really necessary to know. If you look at the pilot operating handbook of a 172, which maybe I'll show you guys at the end, it only has forward and limit because... The airplane's so thin that a change left or right doesn't really affect the characteristics of, an, of the airplane. Sure, no problem. So now we're going to talk about turns, uh, loads, and load factors. So <clears throat> when an airplane is banked, Part of its lift that it's generating, we can call that the vertical component of lift, is translated to a banked or a horizontal lift component. And this is the force entirely, basically, which causes an airplane to turn. But what you have to remember is due to the reduced vertical lift, the wing is no longer generating a direct upwards force, an aircraft will tend to lose altitude in a turn. And you, how you counteract that is by increasing the back pressure. Uh, on the yoke, and that'll deflect the elevator upwards or the stabilator upwards, which will increase that lift or the angle of attack and increase lift. So, like I said, in other words, in a turn, you must increase the angle of attack, increase the airspeed, or increase both. Most of the time, you're just pulling back on the yoke, which is increasing the angle of attack and compensating for that loss of lift. Next thing, a load is the force that an airframe must be able to support in flight, right? So, if you think of like a military aircraft, right? Let's let's talk about the F-18 for a minute. That airplane is built to sustain like nine Gs, right? And when I say Gs, I'm talking about the force of gravity. That airplane can withstand nine times the force of gravity, and its load factor is nine Gs. That's the maximum load factor. So load factor is talked in Gs, and... Uh, it's basically saying what the airplane can handle in relation to Earth's gravity. And we'll talk about this a little bit on the next slide. But first, uh, we're going to show you that horizontal component of lift. So when you're in level flight, you have weight and you have lift. And this is your vertical component of the lift right here. They're directly counteracting each other and everything's, you know, dilly-dally, perfectly fine. When you're in a turn, some of that vertical lift is lost. And it's translated into here, this horizontal component. So the total lift is reduced, but the amount of weight has stayed the same. That force of gravity has stayed the same. So you have to compensate for that lack of lift, and you have to pull back. You have to increase the level angle of attack to increase that vertical component of the lift. Now, this is even more recognized when you're in a steep turn. You lose a lot of that vertical component of the lift. It's all going to the side. Uh, or half of it's going to the side, half is going vertical. But you still have that total weight going to the bottom. Now, when I talk about load factor, uh, we're talking about the force, which is counteracting lift. So you have the weight of the aircraft combined with the centrifugal force. So that weight is that 1G. But the centrifugal force multiplies that 1G. And that's why aircraft, when they turn, you hear, oh, I just pulled 4Gs. That's because you took the weight of the aircraft, which is 1G, and you multiplied that force by turning. Because when you're in a turn, 
you create centrifugal force in the opposite direction of the turn. So you can say that the load factor is the weight plus the centrifugal force. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, I think so. Okay, I hope so. Again, guys, if you have questions, post it in group flights and I'll try to answer it. Cool, let's hop on to the next slide here. So I'll explain that again. In level flight, the wings support the load of the airplane under Earth's gravity. So we can say that one that the load is equal to 1G or the force of Earth's gravity. This is fine and straight in level flight. But because of that centrifugal force I mentioned, which counteracts all turns, every turn that exists has centrifugal force. It counteracts that force to the outside of the turn. So if you're making a right turn, it's counteracting you to the left. If you're making a left turn, it counteracts you to the right and so forth. The wing now must support the load of the airplane, which is that 1G, plus the amount of centrifugal force. And the sum of those forces, like I said, is the load factor. And because of this, it can be said the turns increase load factor. This also means that as the angle of bank increases, the load factor increases, right? If you're on a 10 degree bank, you're not going to have as much centrifugal force. If you're in a 90 degree bank, you're going to have a lot of centrifugal force. So you're going to have less load factor on a, on a shallow bank than you will on a steep bank. And basically, this is the diagram which tells us that. So this shows us for bank angle, our load factor. Actually, this one's actually the increase in stall speed because when you increase the, stall, the uh, load factor, you're also increasing the stall speed. But we'll talk about that again when I get to angle of attack. Um, and just according to this little burp here that I wrote, as bank angle increases, the stall speed increases due to increased load on the wing. And you got to remember, like we talked before, the angle of attack um, this will make more sense when I explain it in a minute. So if you, I know you're going to have questions and post them in the channel so I can answer it. But as a wing turns steeply and you increase that load factor, the angle of attack increases, which causes the wing to stall. Now, normally in level flight, you would stall at a specified airspeed, right? A specified indicated airspeed. But in a turn, you're increasing the normal force of gravity, which is going to change the way a wing stalls. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now, down here, we're talking about the increase in load factor. So at a level bank, you get 1G, I believe, if it'll show up in my PowerPoint, thing won't get in the way. Yeah, so you have 1G at the bottom, and a 20 degree bank, it's 1.06 times the force of gravity. 40 degrees, it's 1.31. 60 degrees, it's 2 times the force of gravity. 80 degrees, it's 5.76 times the force of gravity. So you see the jump here, it exponentially increases as you increase the bank. Now we're going to talk about maneuvers. Um, as a private pilot, not a P1, now this is where I'm going to make a disclaimer. This is not required for the VATS and P1. We're just talking about FAA stuff now, and then we'll get back to the stuff you know that we need to know. Uh, so as a private pilot, you're going to be required to demonstrate some maneuvers, and these are private pilot maneuvers, again, not P1. You won't have to do this. Uh, but the goal of these maneuvers is to demonstrate you understand the concepts of wind drift, air draft con aircraft control, and sound aeronautical decision making. Uh, Christian, let's see. Which wing is the one that will have more load when you are banking right? Uh, they should have an equal amount of load, Christian. They, they, they'll have an equal amount of load in a bank uh, because the entire airplane is banked. Okay, thank you. Uh, but back to maneuvers. Uh, private pilot maneuvers include rectangular course, turns around a point, S turns, steep turns, and stalls. Now, you will have to do steep turns and you will have to do stalls for your P1. Uh, is anybody here, uh, if you want to turn your mic, is anybody here actually training for their private pilot in real life? I'm trying to get a recreational pilot's license. Okay. Brian, I saw you unmute your mic. What are you going to say? I'm training for my private. Oh, I got to take my uh, uh, Oh, God. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. I'm going uh, in the air. Sorry. Yeah, uh, just so everybody knows, Brian's an ATP. He flies fancy jets. Um, <clears throat> cool. Now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about rectangular course. Now, think about trying to draw a square on the ground with the airplane, right? That sounds kind of easy, right? It's not hard. Make four turns, and boom, you got a square. Well, 
as uh, I guess Murphy's Law would say, I don't, I don't know what Law would say, it's not that easy, right? You have a lot of factors that contribute to the way an airplane flies. The main one being wind, right? Now, because of wind, if you were to make four 90-degree turns, you're not going to make a square. So what you have to do is you have to compensate for wind. So how we do that is we always crab into the wind. And this diagram kind of kind of goes over it. So the wind is flowing from right to left here. And we always start in what's called downwind, right? So if you're going right to right to left, you're going to be downwind. Now it's fine. You don't have to crab when you're downwind or upwind because you're directly with the wind. But if you're going across with the wind, the wind's going to push you. So let's say you made a 90 degree turn to try to make a square and you didn't correct. Well, look what happens. You follow this dotted line. If you're pointing this way, the wind's going to blow you. You see, you, see, you see what's happening here? Now, if you do what this pilot did here and crabbed into the wind, you make a straight line that looks like a square. And so here, you're going to have to turn more than 90 degrees to compensate for that wind drift. Now, what that means is that when you turn from here to here, you don't have to turn 90 degrees. You only have to turn maybe 80 or 75 degrees because you're already crabbed into the wind. And when you're upwind, you don't need any kind of wind correction. Now here, again, you're going to turn less than 90 degrees because you have to turn into the wind. <clears throat> and what that'll do is it'll allow you to make that straight line. If you just make a 90 degree turn, you're going to follow this dotted path here. And you're going to make this weird kind of trapezoid you know, figure if you don't apply that wind correction. Does that make sense to everybody? That actually does. Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about turns around a point now. How do you know how much to correct, Daniel? Um, it, it's kind of an art. And, and in the real plane, uh, you'll kind of just see your track. You know, normally you do a rectangular course around something, right? So if you feel like you're making a perfect box, you're probably applying the right around of wind correction. But there's no specific way to find out the wind correction. You kind of just have to eyeball it. And that's part of becoming a private pilot. But it, you have to understand that you will have to add wind correction on certain legs of that square. That's essentially what they want you to know. Now, turns around a point uh, is essentially... The goal of it is to track a perfect circle over the ground. And unlike the rectangular course maneuver where you're only crabbing into the wind on two legs, you're going to constantly be changing your angle of bank because it's a circle. So the entry for turns around a point is always in the downwind. We talked before about how the wind is flowing from right to left, and that would be downwind, right, when you're going one way. When you're going, basically, when the wind is pushing you, you're downwind. When you're going against the wind, you're upwind. That's the that's a basic explanation. Um so you always want to enter that maneuver in the downwind, where the where the angle of bank will be stupid steepest, to bleed um, to bleed off the highest amount of ground speed. Because, let's say somebody tells you, okay, do a forty five degree bank for this. Well, if you were to enter at a forty five degree bank angle. In the upwind. Now you can't go past forty five degrees of bank because when you're downwind, you now have to go past that forty five degrees, to count for that large increase in ground speed. And I'll show you a diagram in a minute that makes more sense than what I'm saying now. Um, and these are the main rules that turns around a point. This last yellow thing here. In the downwind, you should have the steepest bank to compensate for the high ground speed, right? Airplanes don't go a one, you know, airplanes don't drive like a car. You know, if, if it's saying you're doing 100 knots, yeah, you're doing 100 knots through the air. But you got to remember, air wind might be pushing you. So you're doing 100 knots through the air, but you're really doing 120 knots over the ground. It's not like a car where it doesn't. It, it tells you how fast you're going over the ground. You have airspeed, and then you have ground speed. So if it tells you you're doing 100, if the wind's blowing you, you might be doing 120, you might be doing 140. Now, when you're upwind, you should have the shallowest bank because you have a low ground speed, right? You're flying into the wind. You're still doing 100 knots, but that wind is preventing you from going fast over the ground. When you're crosswind, you should have a moderate bank, increasing or decreasing, depending on whether you're transitioning to downwind or upwind. And this diagram should make it a lot less confusing for you guys. So we talk here. Here's a 172. You enter on the downwind, and it's going with the wind. And you need that steepest angle of bank. And this is when you have the highest ground speed. 
and you need the steepest angle of bank to bleed off all that energy. Now, as you're transitioning to crosswind and then eventually an upwind, you're going to basically be decreasing that bank over time. And at the point that you're on the other side of the circle, you should have that shallowest bank because you have the lowest ground speed and you're directly against the wind and you basically keep doing this and now you have the opposite once you're transitioning back to downwind you have that shallow bank and you keep increasing you keep increasing and then you're back to that steepest angle of bank does that kind of make sense to everybody if it's not please i'll i'll, I'll try to explain it a little better Could you like maybe explain a bit more in terms of like the angle of bank, like why it needs more at the beginning? Sure. Like, I feel like I'm not understand. I'm not I'm, sure. I'm not sure. understanding that part. Yeah. So you, because the wind pushes you, right? We talked about how the wind pushes you and it'll change your ground track. The goal is to make a perfect circle over the ground. It might not look like a perfect circle to you from the cockpit because of your your changing bank, but because if you if you don't change your angle of bank, yeah. right? Um, all right, so think of it this way. Let's say you have a car, right? If it's slow, you need more turning of the wheel, right? You need to turn the wheel more in a slow turn to make the same change. When you're fast, you need a very little change in the wheel. Um, do you essentially get what I'm saying? Okay, uh, yeah, I think I'm starting to... So, got it. yeah. So you need you need to turn the least amount when you're going um yeah it, it, and and that applies to ground speed right because your ground speed is changing so when you're faster you have to counteract that pushing tendency by banking more you need to make a steeper turn because if you don't you're going to get pushed outside of the circle and it's not going to look like a circle it's going to look like an oval right, right. Yeah. you, you kind of get that now yeah yeah Thank you. Cool. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about S-turns. Now, S-turns is essentially what we just talked about, but it's split in half, and it's usually over some kind of straight line, usually a, a long road. Um, so it's taking turns around a point to another level. It's just a turn around a point that's changing direction. The same concepts apply. If you have a higher ground speed, you're going to need a steeper bank to compensate for that wind pushing you. If you have a lower ground speed, you're going to need less bank to, to, because you're uh, being pushed against the wind. Uh, and just like turns around a point, the entry for S turns is always in the downwind. So here's another diagram. The entry is here on the bottom right, and you have all that ground speed. So let's say you're doing 120 knots here. Well, as you turn, you need to bleed off that energy, so you're going to have a steep bank. And as you progress through the turn, you're actually going to slow down over the ground. And because of that, you need to start taking the bank out. Otherwise, you're going to finish the turn early. If you keep that steep bank in, you're going to finish the turn somewhere around here. If you if you slowly take the bank out, because that wind is pushing you, you're going to roll out right over the road. And that's kind of the goal. Now, the opposite applies for when you're doing the other end. Here, you need a shallow bank because you're going slow and you need to get further away from the road. But as the wind begins to push you towards the road, you need to increase that bank so that when you roll out, you're over the road again. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. So this is now we're going to talk about P1 maneuvers. This is what you're going to do for VATSIM. Um, now, this is going off the VATSIM requirements. The real world requirements are different. A steep turn for a P1 is a bank that is approximately 45 degrees. It's You can be plus or minus 10 degrees and is performed 360 degrees left and right. Now, there are certain criteria that we establish for the P1 check ride. You must maintain plus or minus 100 feet in the turn, plus or minus 10 degrees of your entry heading. So let's say you start at 060. You need to roll out between 050 and 070. If you don't, that's going to be a fail for that maneuver. And you need to be plus or minus 10 knots of your starting airspeed. That one, I believe, we're a little more lenient on. Um, it's not as important. But the first 200 feet and plus or minus 10 degrees of your heading is critically important. Now, like we said before, when you begin a turn, you lose all that vertical lift. 
So here we say airplanes will tend to nosedive when entering a turn, which requires a moderate increase in back pressure to compensate for that lost vertical lift. Now, how do we recover from that, right? You, we lost that altitude. What's the best way to get it back in a, in a steep turn? Well, the best way to do it is just reduce the bank angle a little bit. If you reduce the bank angle, you're going to increase that lift that you lost. And if you increase the back pressure, you're going to increase it even more. And then once you get back to your target altitude, just go back to 45 degrees. Does that make sense? Um, would rudder make sense as well in these situations, or is it really better to use the bank angle? Um, um, for a steep turn, the only thing you should be using a rudder for is to stay coordinated, because if you start inducing yaw, you're going to create drag, which is going to slow you down. You're going to enter, uh, let's say you're doing a steep turn to the left, right, and you lose altitude. If you try to kick the rudder to the right to gain altitude, you're going to enter a condition what's known as a slip which is essentially the entire airframe is going against the wind and you're going to create so much drag that you're going to slow down a significant amount. You're basically turning the airplane into like a brick wall at that point. So it's better to take the bank angle out, pull back, regain out that altitude, and then put the bank angle back in. And to, and to prevent it from happening again, you know, you might be thinking, well, why am I keep losing altitude? Just keep increasing the back pressure if you keep losing altitude. If you gain too much altitude, increase the angle of bank and reduce the back pressure. It, it goes both ways. So it's kind of these critical skills you have to learn. You have to learn your airplane, what doing certain things with the controls do. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. All right. And now we're going to get to the next maneuver. And everybody here, everybody here is in the news. Or not in the news, but everybody here has probably heard of a stall. If you haven't heard of a stall, I'm going to explain it. As aircraft increase their angle of attack, air no longer flows smoothly over the wing, or just specifically more the upper surface of the wing. As the angle increases, the air becomes turbulent over the top, right? So as that air flows over the top, it no longer sticks to the wing and basically starts like sputtering all over the place. Uh, and because of this, it separates from the top layer of the wing. So that, that uh, low pressure area now kind of just doesn't exist. Now this turbulence causes such a huge decrease in lift that flight cannot be sustained. And that's what we call a stall. And it's one of those important things that you're going to learn as a P1 or even a real world private pilot. Or no matter what level you're on. If you're you know an ATP or um, a commercial pilot, you always talk about stall avoidance because it's such a terrible position to be in for an airplane. Now... The angle of attack in which a wing stalls, right, when that when you can no longer sustain lift, that angle of attack is called the critical angle of attack. And that is the same for every airplane. You cannot change the critical angle of attack. The airplane will always stall at that critical angle of attack. And here's a diagram we'll kind of talk over it, right? So when we're talking about load factor, right? If we're talking about load factor, the angle of attack is increased because of that increase in load factor. So Let's say you're in level flight, right? And you're at, you know, four degrees angle of attack. If you just make a, a turn that and then pull back, that angle of attack might increase to 16 degrees. And at that point, you get this turbulent air over the top at which it separates from the wing, and the wing just can't generate lift at that point. It, it'll begin to stall. So here we have the relative wind is this black line, and the angle between them is the angle of attack. And that's when you get a stall. Cool. Let's talk about spins now. Now, spins are a type of stall in, in its simplest form, or simplest explanation. Um, so as aircraft wings stall, it is possible for one wing to still be generating a greater portion of lift, or one wing to be more stalled than the other. Again, this lift isn't enough to sustain flight. Um, that difference in lift causes a rotation, and that is what we call a spin. Now, it's important to remember that the airplane is not flying. It is stalled when it is in a spin, right? An aircraft can only spin after both wings have stalled. It's not that just one have stalled. Both of the wings have to be stalled. An aircraft will continue to spin as long as one wing continues to generate more lift than the other. 
So here's kind of a diagram, right? So both wings here in, in this condition are stalled. But as you see, this wing here is more stalled and this wing is left stalled. So you could say that this one's generating more lift than this one is. And that causes a rotation to the left. And if we look here, this is a fully developed spin here. And this is basically just spinning down to the earth. Um, and this is something you want to avoid. And the best way to avoid a spin is to stay coordinated. If you're coordinated in flight, you will not spin. And it's very important that you stay coordinated. And we can talk about that in a little bit at the end. If you guys want to, you want me to demonstrate it or something like that, we can talk about that. All right, let's talk about flaps. So everybody here knows what flaps are, I hope. If you don't, flaps are trailing edge devices on the back of an air, airfoil. <clears throat> um, they're lift generating devices, which increase the camber and angle of attack of a wing. But like we talked about before, right? Lift has a byproduct and that byproduct is induced drag. So flaps increase lift, but they also increase induced drag. Now, why is that important for us? Well, that increase in drag allows us to make a steeper approach without increasing our airspeed, right? So let's say we're at 90 knots and we're like, oh, we're too high. Well, if we dump the flaps, we can stay at 90 knots and we'll start sinking. So it's really kind of important that we have flaps. Uh, and there's four main types. You have a plane flap, which essentially is just the trailing edge of the wind. The back end just basically flips down and points down. And that increases the lift and increases the drag. You have a slotted flap. Now, the 172 has slotted flaps. It basically it creates that lift and induced drag, but it also allows air through this little gap here, which increases downwash and increases lift even more. You have a Fowler flap, which is typically found on airliners. So these are flaps which move backwards and downwards, so they increase the surface area of the wing, which increases lift and increases drag. Um, and finally, we have a split flap. Now, one of the most famous aircraft that has a split flap the DC-3. That's got flaps that are essentially underneath the wing, they're underneath the airfoil, and it's basically a cutout that drops down. And that increases lift and induced drag. Um, some of these have pros and cons, we're not going to get into that, uh, but it's important that you know and can recognize the four different types. Okay, here's something that uh, most of you have probably noticed. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you have noticed that airplanes kind of like, oh, sorry, Catalin, you have a question. So when deploying flaps, uh, yes, the cord line is modified when you deploy the flaps. So we talked before how the cord line goes from the leading edge to the trailing edge. Now, the cord line has changed, right? Because the trailing edge is down here. So the cord line is now that imaginary line from the leading edge, but it's still to the trailing edge. So it kind of just comes out of the wing. And same thing here, right? The cord line goes from here to here. It's a straight line. And from here to here, it's a straight line. Does that answer your question, Catalan? Gotcha, thanks. No yep. problem. Uh, so back to ground effect. Most of you have probably noticed that planes love to float above the runway. And we're and it's really something that's kind of a cool phenomena. So when they're within close range of the ground, now specifically the answer is when they're within the length of their wingspan above the ground, right? So let's say the wingspan of a plane's 28 feet. When you're within 28 feet of the ground, you're going to start to experience ground effect. As the lift generated by the wing deflects against the ground, it reduces the induced drag that the wing is producing and causes you to float, right? Because now you have that excess of lift and you're going to start floating. Uh, and it can also cause you to become airborne before reaching the takeoff speed, which is a no bueno, because if you leave ground effect at uh, below takeoff speed, you're going to fall back to the ground, you're never going to get up, uh, into a climb. <clears throat> this is commonly known or referred to as a cushion of air beneath a wing when in close proximity to the ground. That's really a super basic explanation. Think of it as a cushion of air. Now, like I said, if you become airborne in ground effect, you might not be at that airspeed that you need to actually fly. So when you leave ground effect, you have to increase your angle of attack to maintain the same amount of lift, right? Because once you leave ground effect, you're now losing, or you're now increasing your induced drag, which requires you to generate more lift. Um, but because of that, now you need more thrust. So that's why it's always important that you pitch for the correct speeds on takeoff, because if you become airborne too early, you might stall and never get out of ground effect. Does that make sense? 
So would you almost want to pitch down on takeoff? Uh, not necessarily. If you get to the correct takeoff speed before rotating, uh, ground effect isn't really that big of a deal. Um, but if you're doing something, this is something you're not going to have to do. But there's this type of takeoff called a soft field takeoff. And the whole goal of it is to get into ground effect. So really what you do is for this maneuver that you don't have to do. Um, I'm just going into it because you asked is you actually use ground effect to your advantage. So you rotate as early as possible. It doesn't matter what airspeed you're at. You want to get into the air ASAP. So as soon as your wheels come off the ground, you actually do push the nose forward, and you kind of float in that ground effect a little bit. You don't let the wheels come back to the ground. You just kind of float in that ground effect. You let the airspeed build, and once you get to the correct airspeed, you're able to climb out of ground effect. Uh, but let's talk about landing, right? Because you're going to assume the same thing applies. If you're landing and you experience ground effect, pull the power out and kind of just let the plane settle to the ground. It'll The, the parasite drag and other kinds of drag are going to slow the plane down where it will eventually settle down to the ground and the ground effect will cancel itself out. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. All right. So we talked about induced drag. This this is where I'm going to explain what actually causes induced drag. Um, so if we look at this wing really quickly, we're just going to talk about induced drag for a second. You have that high positive pressure on the bottom and left positive, uh, low positive pressure. Uh, bleh, high positive pressure on the bottom, low negative pressure on the top. Um, now what happens is normally the air is flowing this way over the wing and you get lift. But what happens is that positive pressure is like, hey. I can sneak over the tip tip of the wing and I can cancel it out that way. Now that's no good because all our lift is now being canceled out by this leak. Uh, and what also happens because of this is you get a vortex, right? Cause the air doesn't know what to do. It's just like, Oh, I canceled out. Now I'm going to start spinning everywhere. Um, this is the main cause of drag is this vortex here. And, and that becomes a problem because it's going to slow us down. Um, but as we get faster and our angle of attack decreases, that's going to become less prevalent, right? As I said, when we're slow and we have the highest angle of attack, as I said in the beginning, we're generating the most of these vortexes. And that's why you always hear, it's by air traffic control, when you depart after a big aircraft, they always say, caution, wake, turbulence. This is that turbulence that they're talking about. <clears throat> And remember, that's because the pressure from the bottom leaks over to the top and creates a vortex. Does that make sense? All right, cool. <clears throat> so now uh, another thing, we're going to avoid weak turbulence, right? That's probably very important. <clears throat> Those wingtip vortices we talked, by, talked about, which are because of the induced drag of a plane, actually sink. They, they kind of persist in the air for a while. They kind of stay around and just do their thing. But because of gravity, they sink down to the ground. So let's look at this diagram here. You have this big, big jet, whatever it is, and it's generating weak turbulence, those vortices off the wingtips. So if you were to fly anywhere around here, you're going to get a lot of turbulence and it's going to be kind of difficult to fly because those vortices from that airplane are now going over your wing. You're no longer getting smooth air over your wing. And the wing's like, oh no, how am I supposed to keep flying? So it's critically important that you maintain clearance from weak turbulence. Now, another thing, those uh, those weight, that wake is also pushed by uh, wind. So let's say, um, how can I explain this? Let's say you're taking off. If an airplane takes off at the middle of the runway, it's only generating those vortices when it's airborne. So as soon as it rotates, that's when the vortices start. Now, you have to remember, the wind is probably coming down the runway. So if we look at this bottom diagram, this is the wake, and it begins right after the rotation. Now the wind is coming from right to left, and it's pushing those vortices towards you. So it's important to avoid it that you rotate the aircraft and become your aircraft and become airborne before the point at which that airplane took off. And the same thing applies for landing that wind is probably pushing those vortices. So to avoid that turbulence, touch down after the point that plane in front of you lands. Does that make sense?
Oh, I think my audio just uh, died. Nope, you're good. Oh, okay, cool. I thought uh, I didn't see my thing lighting up. So I believe that is most of the aerodynamics, kind of like a crash course for you guys. Uh, another thing, try to stay upwind of a larger aircraft because then you'll never experience their weight turbulence. All right, I believe that's all we have. Uh, we'll conclude our uh, first week. Uh, if anybody doesn't have questions, you know, feel free to leave. I want to thank everybody for showing up. This is my first week doing something like this. Um, but if you have questions, go ahead and ask away. Uh, will you have this presentation provided somewhere? Yep, so it's can... it's going to be recorded. Yep. Okay. Uh, Thorsten, you ask. Can, yes, winglets are actually one of the solutions. <clears throat> they reduce that induced drag by uh, basically not allowing that high pressure area on the bottom to cancel out. It still allows it, obviously, you know, air pressure is going to do its thing, but it decreases that amount of drag. No problem, Ben. Enjoy your day. <clears throat> Could you uh, give me an example of, uh, like, the fly upwind of, a, of an airplane so, like, we don't get the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the... Sure. Um, I'll draw it for you. Um, let me open my paint. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna have to let me see if there's like a paint paint online. <laughs> let's try this. Here we go. That'll work. So let's say uh, this. Can I make this bolder paintbrush? Maybe. Let's say this X is you, right? And this is this is a top down view. Um, top down view. Let's say this is you. This 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 X. And let's say the wind is coming this way. My bad. Let's say the wind is. I just want to erase this because I don't. Let's say the wind is coming this way. And let's say there's an airliner flying over here, right? And he's generating all this wake coming off of his airplane. This wake is not going to flow towards you because the wind is going is pushing it away from you. You're here. You're upwind from the other aircraft. Downwind would be somewhere down here. Upwind would be somewhere up here because you're upwards of the wind. And here you're downwards of the wind. So this wake is never going to hit you. Now, let's let's say it's reversed, right? Let's say... Um, let's say... This is you. This is the airliner. Oh. Uh, is there a, a revert? Undo. Yeah, uh, whatever. Let's say this. Yeah, this can undo there on uh, the edit. Oh, whatever. let's just say that's the airliner. Now he's generating all this weight turbulence, and the wind is going in the same direction. Well, now what's going to happen is all of this turbulence is now going to just run into you. It's going to be blown, and you're going to get covered in turbulence. It, that that's one of the simplest explanations I can give to you. Um. I don't know if that helps you at all, or if you want me yeah, to try no, to... that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. Not a question, but uh, thank you very much, James, for doing this. No problem at all. Anybody have any more questions? You can. You guys can unmute your mics now if you have questions. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, James, just in terms of um, studying uh, ground school stuff for private pilot's license or all the, all the numbers you went through today like the um the degrees for the and the speed for the stalls and the the forces the g's and stuff are those numbers that we should be studying to memorize or is it just the principles that we should be learning um the numbers aren't so much important i i don't you know, I don't memorize the exact, you know, G amount that an 80 degree turn gives me. I know where to find it in case, you know, I want to see, um, you know, what kind of banks I can do. You know, every air airplane does have a G limit, so it's important to know how much bank you can really do. Uh, but it's more important to really know those principles. But uh, are, are, were you referring to, like, for the maneuvers? No, I think just... Um... Just in general, really, I think you've answered that question. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Havard, no problem. Uh, I hope to see you guys next week.
Uh, I'm sure I can find this somewhere, but I guess since I have you here, uh, in the <laughs> degrees of a uh, bank, yep. uh, is each line sort of like 10 degrees? Uh, on the attitude indicator? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so here, I'll pull up a... Uh... So that's exactly correct, right? So 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees. Then you'll usually have a dot or another line that's a 45, and then you'll have a 60, and this line here is 90. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve, um, again, it, uh, I, it doesn't, it's not always there. Again, it counteracts thrust. It's not there if there's no thrust. For the steep turns, you you do forty five degrees. Is that correct? For for our steep turns for uh, RP one, yes, forty five degrees. All right. Anybody else? Uh, we got. Uh, we actually, we finished actually about twenty minutes early. So. Just sign up for next week. It's already open. Yep. I hope to see all of you next week. Um, more be I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have made later on uh, in my DMs. Just shoot me a DM. And uh, yeah, Daniel, right? Paint online. Um, if you have any questions, shoot me a DM. Um, and we're next week. I think we're going to talk about aircraft systems. So we'll learn a bit, a little bit about fuel systems, um, avionics, stuff like that. And uh, hopefully you guys will uh, enjoy that. So I will uh, see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.